Don't you let nobody turn you round. Keep on to Galilee. No, don't you let nobody turn you round. Don't let them turn you round. Don't let them turn you round. No, don't you let nobody turn you round. Keep on to Galilee. to be here. Praise God for um, an encouraging church. Um, young people need a lot of encouragement. Amen? Amen. Young people need encouragement even when they're bad. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I was one of those bad ones. You just didn't see it. So <laughs> praise God for those who saw it and encouraged me anyway. Um, and I hope that today I can pay you back by encouraging you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So um, before we start the message, I um, want everyone to receive paper. Hopefully there's enough. If there's not, then you're going to have to split your paper in half with the person next to you. <laughs> um, once everyone has paper, um, those who already have paper, you can turn to Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. Today, um, I just want to give you a disclaimer. I'm encouraging you that this is not a sermon. This is a discussion, amen? Amen, a sermon is when I talk to you. Discussion is when we talk to each other. So if I'm talking to myself in the lights, then I'm not accomplishing my purpose. I need you to, to talk back, to talk to me, to talk to each other, amen? Amen, so we're gonna be looking at Psalm 1611, and today we're going to be um, going um, into different parts of the Bible to try and get a deeper understanding of John 316. Everybody heard the scripture reading, right? John 3.16, sometimes it's helpful to look at some things that we've been looking at all of our life 
and just see, you know, um, sometimes things lose me meaning, right? You get used to your family member there being there the whole time, and then they leave for a vacation, and they come back, it's all new. But, or maybe, you know, um, God forbid something happens to a family member, and then all of a sudden now it's like, man, let me give you a flower in the hospital, you know? It's something about um, getting used to something that can lose its meaning, but it's still valuable. So John 3, 16 is valuable, and we want to look into the meaning. So once you have your papers, hopefully someone can get the people upstairs. Um, just going to open up with one more word of prayer. Father, um, thank you so much for your word, for your love, and we just pray that you will lead us, guide us, teach us, help us as we discuss to discover the value again of John 3, 16. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, you have your papers, um, but first we're going to read this verse, right? <laughs> so it says, or actually we can read it together. One, two, three. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Who do you think this is talking about? If you have your Bible turned there, I guess you can look at the previous verses, but who do you think this is talking about? Who is, um, is going to show someone the path of life? Jesus, God? Yes, God is going to show this person, David, the path of life. Not death, but life. And in God's presence is boring. <laughs> it's annoying. It's, uh, it's just going to be... Uh, years and years of having halos over our head. <laughs> no, it says fullness of joy. Not just joy, but what? Fullness of joy. How many people had joy this week? Yeah? Oh, that's good. I should probably start asking questions. Who, um, who had pleasures this week? Yeah? Somebody did something fun? I'm going to pick on someone. Somebody raise your hand. Yeah? Oh, I see a hand there. What did you do for fun this week? Okay, maybe you're shy. Okay, someone tell me what you did for fun this week. What gave you pleasure this week? Okay. You went to school? That brings you pleasure. That's good. You had a day off. Amen. Amen. Someone else? Yes. Okay. You can tell me afterward. All right. One more. You ran a 5K. Oh, that's nice. Okay. So there are many things, that's, things that bring us pleasure and many things that bring us joy. But God wants to give us what kind of joy? Fullness, Fullness of joy. Do you believe that? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, where do you think we're going? Because right now, I don't know if it's just me, but I didn't have everything was not fullness of joy this week. This planet doesn't have a lot of joy sometimes. And I'm assuming that this verse is applicable now but it's even more applicable where? When Jesus comes back, right? Because in heaven, the things of this world that are negative will be done away with and it'll be all positive, amen? So we can say that this verse applies to someone who's living in whose presence? God's presence. Now, who are the people that are already in God's presence right now? Who, who is um, directly in the presence of God in heaven, I should say? Angels. Angels, right? We even have a few human beings there, but mostly angels. And these angels, based on this verse, what is the experience of these angels? Fullness of joy. So we're missing out, guys. <laughs> we're missing out. Angels are experiencing fullness of joy. Now, there's um, a twist to this. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Because we see this, we believe it, and angels are mostly experiencing this, but 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 tells us about someone who it didn't seem like that to him. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, 3, and 4. Maybe we can start at verse 4 so we can see who we're talking about. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, just the, first two, um, just the first phrase. It says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. 
So this is saying that there are angels who, according to the previous verse, were in God's what? Presence where there's what? Fullness of joy. Not only that, but there's pleasure how long? Sometimes? Forever. So there's pleasure forever, and then there's an angel who decides, I don't want to do that. Was he alone? No. What could have happened? That makes no sense. So if you have a day off, are you going to go back to work if a day off makes you happy? <laughs> no. If you like your favorite food, are you going to give it back after you paid for it? No. Something happened. Let's look at the verse 2 and 3. So this is what, um, what we know as Lucifer or Satan started to do. So Satan by himself started speaking and then other people started following him. Verse 2. Let's read that. One, two, three. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Let's stop right there. So pernicious, I believe I'm saying, pronouncing it correctly, is destructive. So many will follow their destructive ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. I don't know if you caught it in the previous verse, but what did it describe God's way as being? God's way, sorry. God's way. In Psalm 16, verse 11. Good, right? That will show me the path of life. So here we have God's way, the path of life. And here is the path of truth. But here there's Satan speaking evil of it. Does that make sense? So Satan sees God's ways. God says, do A. Satan says, that's bad. God says, do B. Satan says, that is not bad going to make you happy. Does that make sense? So Satan does this, but why did he do it? Let's look at verse 3 now. You can read it. <laughs> Shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not? We're just going to focus on that first phrase. What does it mean to covet? When you want something, right? Want something that's not yours. Okay. So it's not so bad to want something, right? I'm pretty sure everybody wants air, right? Because then you would not live. <laughs> Everyone wants something, but when you want something that's not yours or you want something bad, that's when it's a problem. So looking at this verse, Satan wanted something, and then he used feigned words or fake words or words that you mold. I don't know if any of you, um, I'm assuming most of you were kids at one point. So <laughs> I don't know if you ever had a time that you can remember, you may have put it away in your memory, when you wanted your parents to do something and you knew that if you told them maybe all of the details and all of the facts that they needed to know, they might not have given it to you. So then you said it in a way that they would be more likely to do what you asked them for. Like, I want this toy. You know, I'm not going to tell them the price. I'm just going to tell them, I want this for Christmas. And then, or maybe you want something from the fridge and your mom is reserving it for something else. This guy, Satan, used molded words, fake words, to make merchandise of the other angels. And many followed his destructive ways because he spoke evil of God's ways. Does that make sense? So if I want you to do, um, if I want you to buy my product, I want you to buy my phone that I'm pitching to you, I'm going to talk bad about the other phone. And then my phone is going to look really good. <laughs> Does that make sense? So all Satan has to do to trick us is to say, my way will make you happy. His way, <laughs> don't do that. It's not going to make you happy. So right now, we're going to do um, something that a lot of people don't like going to the doctor's office. We're going to look at a little diagnostic test. Sometimes doctors have to run tests, right? If they run the test, then they can see what's wrong with you or what's right with you. And this test, you know, there's something called sensitivity and specificity. Sometimes these tests aren't completely accurate or they're accurate when you're trying to rule out something or rule in something. So right now you have your test right on your paper. It's blank right now, but we're just going to write a few things, okay? This is a test to see if the devil caught us or God caught us? What is this test for? Does the devil have us tricked or does God have us um, believing the right thing? And like I said, sometimes some tests, 
They come out negative, but they're really positive. Sometimes they're positive, but they're really negative. So don't take this as salvation, what you're about to do, okay? <laughs> but we're just going to look at this and see if this can help us get a good, accurate picture of our condition. Um, some people like to joke around with me about my health and stuff. <laughs> I used to think I was really healthy um, with my vegetarian diet. But then one time I went to the doctor and I saw that I wasn't as healthy as I thought I was. That's good. You can run away from the facts or you can say, all right, you know what? I have to change some things to make this diet more healthier. Amen? So we're going to look at this. And I don't want you to go home all crying, boo-hoo. I want you to look at this and say, okay, I'm going to change some things, all right? So we just have 10 things we're going to look at. So I want you to write down on your paper, we're going to try and fit it into 24 hours, what your typical day looks like. Please don't be the difficult kid in class who's like asking all the exceptions. Just a typical day, not the weekend of your day, okay? So I want you to write down first how many hours or minutes or whatever it is that you spend um, going to work or school and traveling there. So I just want you to write school, travel, work, whatever it is. Next to it, write down the amount of hours or time that you spend. Okay, is that clear? Hope I'm clear. Sometimes I have problems being clear. <laughs> so on your paper, you're just gonna write down that amount right next to it. Some work at home, that's fine, that's fine. But if you don't have any travel time, then that's okay. Just write down the hours you work. That's it. The hours you work slash travel to work or school, okay? Now the next thing I want you to write, everybody has that, is to write down the amount of hours that you spend um, in recess, or for us who don't have recess anymore, exercise. Um, write down the amount of time you spend uh, recess or exercise, or um, hanging out with friends. How about that? Exercise, recess, hanging out with friends. <laughs> so, I want you to write that, that down. If you don't have a paper, you can write it down on your phone or something. All right, the next thing, we're on number three. I want you to write down how much time you spent eating. You know, that really good food, you know? Just write that, write that time down. If it's only um, five minutes running out the house, just write down five minutes. Just, yeah. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, and everything else, if there's anything else. <laughs> so write that down. All right, we're on number four. So now I want you to write down how much time you spend on the phone or calling or texting. However amount of time. Something I like to say about sermons, sometimes we can listen to sermons and we're listening for somebody else. Like, man, it would be really good if that person was here to hear this. <laughs> Don't listen to this sermon for, your, for somebody else. Listen to it for yourself. If you're going to say, hmm. Make a mm by yourself, okay? <laughs> Don't think about anybody else, all right? So now the next thing I want you to write down is how much time you spend in media or entertainment. I'm not saying these things are bad, but just writing out the time. How much time do you spend? All right? So, so far we've had school, work, we've had exercise, we've had eating, we had phone, we had media, we had texting. How about sleeping? Sleeping. How much time you spend sleeping? Sleeping time. All right. Anybody confused? Everybody good? We're good? Okay. All right. So now we're going to go through um, the last few ones really quickly. So I want you to write down how much time do you spend in Bible study? How much time do you spend in Bible study? We're not into quantity, we're into quality, but just write down how much time you spend in Bible study. Okay? I want you to now write down how much time you spend in prayer. Okay? The next thing, we're almost done, the second to last thing, I want you to write down how much, or rather, how many souls have you led to Jesus by yourself or with groups in the last five years to Jesus? How many souls, how many people have you led to Jesus Christ 
as a personal savior in the last five years, where you direct influence, directly see that person And the last one, I want you to write down not how many Bible studies you've given in the past, but how many Bible studies can you right now, right now, whatever topic, give. So if you can teach someone about the love of God, that's one. If you can teach somebody about what happens when you die or when Jesus is coming back or um, faith, whatever it is, I want you to write down that number today, right now, how many of those could you share if someone came, opened that door and said, you know what? My car just broke down in front of your church. I need a change. What can you teach me? What would you share with him? What topics could you share with him? All right. So, like I said, this uh, diagnostic test is not salvational, but I hope it impresses your mind the way it impressed my mind when I first had this, when I went to Oakwood. Um, my biology teacher, incidentally, um, <laughs> one of the you know, so-called professions where you know, many people turn away from God, here it is my biology teacher is teaching me, and I see him in a worship doing this test with people and I'm there in the audience and I'm looking at my paper and I'm like, man, this is interesting. Um, I actually met someone on the way here who drove me here, Muslim, knew that my name was Ahmed and he was, you know, really, really nice guy and he was just letting me know some things that makes him think that his religion is the correct one and, you know, I just, I'm learning about both actually and I just asked him some questions, and then he confessed, you know? I'm not really all that religious. Like, I, I'm, I haven't looked into all of it that much, but I was like, you know, if you're gonna tell me to do something, I need some evidence, you know? I'm trying to look up, I'm looking up some of the things, and I, you know, I shared one thing with him from Islam that I'm learning, and I shared one thing about Christianity, and we both agreed you can't judge a religion or a denomination or something by its abuse. What do I mean? If a seven-day Adventist goes and blows up the street right across from here, should everybody now judge all seven-day Adventists by that one person? No. And it's the same thing. If somebody comes around to you and is just acting all nice to you, should you all of a sudden join their religion? <laughs> no, right? So we have to consider those last four things you wrote down as very important because people want to believe something that's true because most times something that is true is gonna make you happier. But if we don't know these things for ourselves and we're not able to share it, other people are missing out. And that person today, you know, praise God, like I, about a month ago, I didn't know much about what I was sharing with him, but I took it upon myself to go and learn. So I just wanna encourage you, take note of what you wrote there um, we're going to do something different with it at the end, but we're going to continue into John chapter 3, verse 14 to 19, and we're going to try to discover the value. We're going to learn today um, one topic you're going to be able to do after this sermon is share about the love of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. So you can write down the text on that paper if you want, but today I want you to find some verses. We're going to go through a, quite a few verses, but whichever verses stick out to you, take it out. Don't take what I said, because I could have just deceived you. I want you to go back, look at it, and think of how I could share this with someone in five minutes. Is that too hard? No, nothing's too hard for God, right? So we're going to look into John chapter 3, verse 14 to 19, and we're going to go through different parts of it. So let's go to John 3, verse 14 to 19. So looking at John 3, verse 14 to 19, this is our roadmap. This is where we're going to, it's our springboard to go to different parts of the Bible. Because if we read the verses around John 3, 16, we'll get, the, we'll get much more of the message of what Jesus is trying to say. So John 3, verse 14 and 15 are before John 3, verse 16. So can someone 
anyone, tell me, what is John 3, verse 14 and 15 about? It says, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. So if we want to understand what it means for the Son of Man, who is what? Jesus. If we want to understand the significance of Jesus being lifted up, we have to understand what? How Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Does that make sense? So if we want to discover this value, can someone please give a brief two sentences of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness? <laughs> Backsliding, unfaithful. He's doing miracles. Right. Right. Complaining, right. Yes, they were getting bitten by snakes. Yes. Make a bronze serpent, right. Yes. Did they have to do anything else besides look? Okay. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's it. Yes. Amen. I wish I had more participants like that. So you guys have to just like participate. So he can't talk anymore, right? He can't talk. That was beautiful. Amen. So I want everybody to look at the lights. Look at the lights. Look at the lights. Imagine these lights turned into snakes and came down. That's what it was like for these Israelites. As soon as they started complaining, after seeing all of these miracles, all of these times where God is saying good things and he's like, all right, guys, let it go. All right, you're doing bad. I'm going to be good to you anyway. I'm going to send manna. Immediately, now they're getting bitten. And let me ask you something. If you're in the middle of the desert, aren't there snakes there already? So where these snakes were all this time? God protecting them. So is God being evil by letting natural nature take its course? No, he's letting natural things happen. You step into the wilderness, you sleep in there for months, and nothing happens to you. That's a miracle, right? So God was having mercy all up until this point, and it's not like he took away his mercy. He just put in a little bit of justice. He just stepped back, let them see what happens with their destructive actions, complaining. Let's see the destructive consequences of your actions. And I'm not going to just leave you to suffer. I'm going to make a way of escape. You know some people still died that day? All they had to do was what? To look. And if you keep looking at that thing, Whatever just happened is as good as gone. Amen? So one point that I got from that, we have a lot of negative things happening in the world, and it may be tempting to say, God, where are you? And God is saying, no, I've been here all this time. Otherwise, you guys would have been destroyed a long time ago. Adam and Eve sinned. What happened? Did they die immediately? No. Nothing happened to them. They just kept on living, right? God made some other consequences, short-term consequences, but the long-term death one didn't come till a thousand, almost a thousand years later. God loves to delight in mercy. Does that make sense? God's been having mercy on everyone in this world for about how long since Jesus died. <laughs> and now that he's starting to step back, people want to question God, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> All these people dying, doing wrong, and you're not saying anything. Where are you? You know there's enough food in this world to, to really feed everyone? So what's happening? People are looking at God, saying, God, how come people are suffering? There's so many people hungry. And God is looking at us like, excuse me? 
there's enough in this whole world to feed everyone. He said there would always be poor. He never said everybody would be hungry. So whose fault is it? Right? People have resources, hoarding it up, never going to be able to use all of it. <laughs> right? That's the problem. It's God's problem isn't forgiving us. He could say, you know what? I forgive everyone coming to heaven. You know what the big problem is? It's this right here. It's Ahmed. Because if he takes us to heaven where there's fullness of joy, just like heaven is where Lucifer was, is Ahmed going to bring back sin into heaven? Does Ahmed trust God? If I take Ahmed back into heaven and I give him all these resources, how is he going to use it? Well, let's take a look at how he's using it on earth. Does that make sense? So the problem isn't God changing us in an instant, giving us a perfect nature, because these perfect nature's angels sin. This perfect nature, Adam, sin. There has to be something else than snapping your finger and saving a human being. He's into character change. Does that make sense? So now we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 4 and 5 rather, five and six, sorry. Um, while we're turning there, can I get um, just three names for Jesus that you like? Um, one from a young person, one from a, I don't know, adult, one from a person who is, has grandchildren. How about that? Just a name for Jesus. Savior. Jehovah. Sustainer. Okay, amen. We're going to look at another name for Jesus. And I want you to think of John 3, 16, right? All right. So Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5 and 6. Let's read that. 1, 2, 3. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So this king, he's going to reign, and he's going to do whatever he feels like to make himself happy? No, he's going to execute what? Justice and judgment, right? When we see bad things on the news, we want justice, right? But when we're in trouble, we want mercy, right? <laughs> so this person, this king, is going to execute judgment. Now let's see what his name is. Let's read verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be, Israel shall, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So what's his name? Another name for Jesus is? So let's go back to John 3, 16. John 3, verse 16. Right? John 3, verse 16. So everybody knows it by memory. We're going to look at verse 17 and 18, right? So God just says, believe in him. You won't perish. You'll have everlasting life. Let's read verse 17 and 18 now. For God sent not his son into the world to, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the... Okay, so if there are already snakes in the wilderness, back to the illustration, right? There's already snakes in the wilderness. The natural consequences, you're going to suffer. You're going to get bitten, right? Here in verse 18, it's saying these people are condemned already. We already sin. We already fall short of the glory of God. The natural consequence of doing destructive things is death. The natural consequence of doing these evil things is condemnation already. But if you believe in the name of Jesus, another name for that is the Lord our righteousness, you'll be saved. But if you don't believe in someone else who is righteous for you, you're already condemned. Because I can write down all the good things you've done in your life, I can write down all the bad things you've done in your life, I'll probably add on more of those things that you didn't know that were bad, but you did them. And if I weigh them, I'm pretty sure, just like me, <laughs> you're not going to make it. But we have a Savior who, if we believe in his name, 
as our righteousness, we're covered. It's like going to court and knowing that you're already going to get what you want, but you're the one who was in the wrong. Why is Jesus doing this for free? Why does he do this for us? Because let's read verse 19. Here is the condemnation. Why is he doing this for us? This is what we are. Verse 19. That light is common to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. You wouldn't do something wrong if you know you're going to get punished, unless you really like what you're about to do. We do what is wrong because we like it. That's it. So God has to come into us and do surgery to help us to love things that he loves, to make us like things that he likes, because we already love things that are wrong. It's trying to change a whole character, a whole mindset, to get back into how it was in heaven, where we trust him, where we believe everything he says is pleasurable. Whatever he tells me to do, on the other end of this, something good is coming. It may not be now, but it's gonna be good. He's trying to do that surgery on us, and the problem that Jesus was running into is that people loved darkness rather than light because they were already doing wrong things. That diagnostic test we did, the guilty feeling sometimes we had because we do wrong, these things hold us back from experiencing and believing the love of God, from experiencing and believing and doing what God says. If I take too much time with my Bible, I'm not gonna be able to get to work on time. I don't feel like waking up, I'm too tired. I don't want to talk to those people out there. They might hurt me. You know, I don't even know how to do it. Let the pastor do it. Let's hire a Bible worker. What? That conversation I had with that person in that car really opened my eyes. It's not just Christians. <laughs> it's Muslims. It's atheists. We love to let other people do the thinking for us. Let other people do the hard studying for us. Let other people do the preaching for us, teaching for us. We just, this society is built on people doing things that they're good at, and we do what we're good at. But as soon as you ask someone to do something they're not good at, oh, I tried it and it didn't work for me. <laughs> you do it. Guys, God expects more of us. A parent has to put on so many hats. You can't tell your child, man, I'm too tired, man. You can't be crying at night. You were just born, but too bad. What? A mother has to be a feeder. You have to be a disciplinarian. You have to put on so many hats. If you're a, if you're a child, you don't just go to school. You have, you have times where you have to learn math, you have to learn reading, you have to learn so many different things. This notebook is what you write on. Your textbook is probably be bigger than this. And you don't just have one textbook. You have probably 12 different grades that you're gonna go to, 12 different books, and you don't just take one class. You take like four or five or six classes. You're telling me you can't learn this itty bitty Bible? Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, you can learn it. It's just gonna take time, little by little, just like first grade, just like kindergarten. So we're gonna go to some verses that are very encouraging because if we were, I think Psalms, David said it correctly, God, if you were to really mark my iniquity, <laughs> nobody would stand before you. Because when I do tests like this, or when I think about the things I've done, I'm just like, man, there's no hope for me. <laughs> But where's the hope? Let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 17 to 22. Romans chapter 4, verse 17 to 22. If you miss this part of the sermon, you miss the whole sermon. If you get this part of the sermon, you can leave. I mean it. If you have somewhere to go, you can leave after. If you get it, not just read it, but get it. Because if you think you get it and you get a homework and you get your homework back to you and it was wrong, you didn't really get it. So. Let's get this. Romans 4, verse 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So <clears throat> actually, I want us to, to, to read this, but we're going to also read where he's quoting from. Genesis 15, verse 5 and 6. I'm going to read that, and then we're going to read the Romans verse. So Genesis 15, verse 5 and 6. This is God speaking to Abraham. Abraham is saying, you know what? I'm like 75 years old plus, I don't have a child, my wife is barren. What's happening, Lord? 
Genesis 15, verse 5 and 6, it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So this is Abraham being told by God at 75 years old, his wife is past, you know, that time, and God is saying, your children that you can't have right now are going to be as numerous as the stars. This is the same Abraham who God, when Abraham lied, you know, which was unfortunate, Abraham used, God told Abraham, pray for these Egyptians' wombs because God shut up all of the women in Egypt so that they couldn't have any children. God told Abraham, pray for their wombs, but God wasn't giving Abraham a child yet. God is using this servant, but God hasn't given him his prayer request yet. So it's the same thing with us. I just want to go aside on that. Sometimes we pray for God to do things, and we don't get the answer we want. It doesn't mean you're not God's servant, because that would mean Abraham's not God's servant. And God is still expecting us to be faithful, amen? To still believe his promises. So now let's go to Romans chapter 4 to understand what just happened. Romans chapter 4, right? Verse 17 to 22. Let's read that. As though they were. Let's stop right there. What is God able to do based on that last phrase? Call things that are not existing yet as if they are. Go back to Genesis when you have time. Before there was a sun, God said, let there be light. No sun, let there be light. He made the plants before he made the sun. So you know what the first plants, their first piece of sunlight was? The light that God spoke, right? So you know what food we eat and <laughs> the animals eat? In? They're eating food based off of the plants that got their light first from God. God says things, and then it just becomes. So if God says something, it automatically becomes true. Does that make sense? All right, so let's read the next verse. This is talking about Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which is spoken, so shall thy seed be. Okay, let's stop. Why is it saying that against hope, Abraham believed in hope? What does he mean by against hope? Too old. This is what? Impossible. This cannot naturally happen. In fact, it has never happened. But he believed in this hope. Where did he get this hope from? Who told it to him? God. So because God said it, Abraham what? Believed it. Because when God says something... It must happen. Let's read the next verse. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of... Amen, amen. So, based on this verse, I want you to teach me. It says, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. So if I want to have weak faith, I have to consider the circumstances that are going against God's word. If I want to have strong faith, somebody tell me what that means. Based on this verse, not based on me. You can't answer. <laughs> what do I have to do? Based on this verse, we discovered what weak faith, it's safe to assume that what? Strong faith means what? I trust God even when things look like it's going against what he just said. What was going against what God said in Abraham's life? Not only was he getting older, but he's past the age, right? That's the hope that he was believing in against hope. And God is saying he wasn't weak in faith by considering. Sometimes when we read God's word, if you consider all the bad things that are going on, you're not going to believe what God has to say, right? But if you want to have strong faith, 
Are you going to just pray or are you going to look at what God says about what you're praying about? Does that make sense? If I want to have strong faith, is it possible to have strong faith without the Bible? Absolutely not, because you have to know what God says in order to believe it. Sometimes we don't have faith because we're not looking at what God says. Or we're looking at the circumstances and we're not looking at what God says too. I'm not saying go around looking like, oh man, everything's going great. Happy Sabbath. How are you? Good. How was your week? Great. No, it wasn't great. Pray for me. It wasn't great. But I'm holding on by faith. And I'm not just saying faith, but I actually have words to base my faith on. Does that make sense? So when you're going through things, you have to go to the Word of God. Look for verses that deal with what you're struggling with. If it's a prayer request for something you need, look at verses about God providing. If you know you have a temper, find verses that deal with temper, anger. If you know you can't love your husband, hello, time to look at verses that talk about loving the person when you disagree, right? That's what the Word of God is for. So now this last verse, verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, doing what? And being what? A little? Fully persuaded that what? When we believe what God says, when we don't believe what God says, I should say, that doesn't take away any of his power. He's still going to be God. But when you believe that he's able to fulfill his word and you're fully persuaded, that's when you can give glory to God. When you read the promises of God, sometimes I have to even catch myself, right? Because I'm reading it and it just becomes a, just a repetition thing. Like, you know what? God says you supply my needs. Amen. I'm about to take this test. And I just have to stop. If I really believe that, I would be smiling right now. I don't know if you ever had to take a test where you weren't completely ready for it. I've had to take some of those tests. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, I'm really reading this verse and I have to believe something Yes, I prepared, but I feel unprepared. I have to believe this word. If I really believe God was going to supply my need, wouldn't I be smiling? Right? If somebody says, I'm going to give you $100 for your birthday, wouldn't you be smiling? Because you know they're going to what? Give it to you, right? Especially, let's say the president said that to you, right? Right? Or a governor gave it, told you, I'm going to give you $100 because I like what you're doing. You, you better believe he has the ability to do it, and he's going to do it. Right? So how much more our God, when he promises something, he's able to back it up? So when we say the promises of God, catch yourself if you're not saying it with faith. Lord, I'm fully persuaded that you will fulfill this word. I just read it. I believe it. You said it. I believe it. All right, Lord, you have to fulfill it. And I'm going to comply with the conditions and let it happen. So how does this apply? John 3, 16. He said, if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have. I'm not going to say raise your hands, but often, not even just often, even just recently, talking to some friends, I asked them, you know what? If Jesus was to come back, or rather not if Jesus was to come back, if you were surrounded around a lot of people who had weapons in their hands, right? I'm not asking you what you would do to them. I'm just asking, if you were to die, where would you go? And I, 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 no, where would you go? Tell me. If you can't answer that question affirmatively, yes, I'm going to heaven, you don't believe the word of God. Period. He says he's your righteousness. He says, I know that you make mistakes and you do sins. I know that you have these problems. I'm going to change it. But if you don't believe what I say, how can I make a change in your life? Lucifer's problem in heaven, God says, I love you, and this is what I want you to do. Satan says, I don't believe you love me, and I don't believe what you say. The reason why it's salvation by faith is because it's the whole thing that started this problem in, in heaven. It was a faith problem that caused Satan to leave heaven. He stopped believing that God's way was for his good. Doesn't it make sense that it would be a faith solution so that we could be saved? So you can come to church every Sabbath. You can pay your tithe. But if you can't believe what God says when he says it, you're in the same shoes as Lucifer. 
Why would you wanna do that when he's done so much? In fact, we're gonna go to some of the things he's done just to give you some more evidence, some more reasons for your faith so that when the devil or your guilt or even after you sin after this presentation, including myself, you can go back to these promises and say, no, this is reality. I'm gonna believe it, amen? Amen, so let's just hurry on on. I don't wanna keep you here too long. Let's go to Colossians 2, verse 12 and 13. Colossians 2, verse 12 and 13. Let's see what happens when we believe in Jesus. We're looking at what John 3.16 really means. John 3.16, what does it mean? So Colossians 2, verse 12 and 13. Let's read that first verse, verse 12. One, two, three. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Let's stop. So when Jesus, right, he was resurrected from the dead, he died and was buried, what is that like for us? His death and burial was like our what? Baptism. How many people were baptized before? Raise your hand. Amen. You are officially, according to this, in Jesus, you are, you were dead. You were dead. By baptizing, you went into the water. That represented Jesus' what? Death. And now it says that when he resurrected him from the dead, it's just like you, by the operation of God through the faith. Does that make sense? So you come out of the water, it's like Jesus was what? Resurrected. So verse 13, what does that say? What does this mean to be dead? Let's read it. One, two, three. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you some trespasses. Only the trespasses when you really, really are a nice Christian. When you've come to church enough. All trespasses. All. Everything. Every single thing. And he's quickened you together. He's brought you alive from the dead, just like Jesus was alive from the dead. God has changed you and transformed you. So now because of that, we get to do whatever we want. We get to sin a storm because now I'm saved by the blood of the lamb. I can go to the club. I can shoot people. I'm going to be saved. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1. Because if you really believe that you are in heaven, in Jesus, and your life is changed. Your life was dead before. Let's read Colossians 3, verse 1. 1, 2, 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. So, if I really believe that I'm resurrected with who? Jesus. Then I'm going to seek what? The right things. The things that are in heaven. Do you guys see what God is doing? We're on earth, but he's trying to take us to training school here so that he can prepare us for where? Heaven. So he has us saved by the blood of the lamb. Jesus died for you. And now he's trying to teach you how to live in heaven. You are risen with Christ. So seek those things which are above. So if, let me ask you a question. If I was in heaven and you were in heaven and you saw that I was about to fall into a ditch, would you laugh or would you help me? If you saw me about to run in and you were close enough for me to hear you, would you shout or would you keep quiet? Shout, right? Because you what? Care for me, at least in heaven, you would care for me. Come on guys, let's respond, <laughs> all right? So in heaven, my behavior changes. If I'm in the presence of God and I'm tempted to do something wrong, if God was right next to me and I'm tempted to do something wrong, wouldn't that make it a little bit easier to do what's right? Right? So God wants us to get used to reading the Bible so we can realize he's always with us. Does that make sense? God is trying to rewire our brains. Don't wait till you're in heaven, East New York. You're in heaven now, in a sense. And because you're in heaven now, I want you to act like it. If your brother, white, black, white, black, white, white, black, Caribbean, African, if your brother is suffering in heaven, 
in heaven, would you walk past him? Right? Well, let's look at how they do it in earth. Because we're all saved by the blood of the lamb, right? How do you treat my children, right? God has no grandchildren, amen? Right? So how do you treat my children? These are questions that God is trying to answer. How do we know he's trying to answer it? Let's go straight to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because there's something going on that God wants our eyes on. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to end very soon. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. So we talked about Jesus, who is, what's his other name? The Lord, our righteousness, right? Not sometimes when we do the right thing when we go to church, but all the time, right? And we learned that just because he's saving us, just because he's our righteousness, God is covering us with his credit card called Jesus, and he wants us to learn how to spend money correctly. Amen? He wants us to learn how to handle the resources he's given us. So while he's covering us, he wants us to learn how to do things right. Not to save us, right? We can't save ourselves, but he wants us to get to learn how to live in heaven. Amen? Why? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Let's see what else Jesus' other hat is. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must, let's read together. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Stop. Does it say only the adults in church? Does this say only those who have spent time getting to know the Lord? This includes children. This includes me. This includes adolescents, teenagers, rebellious. No, that doesn't work with God. Everyone is going to appear before the judgment seat, not of some vindictive, want to kill you judge. This is the person who's willing to die for you. So if the person who's willing to die for you is willing to judge you, don't you think he'll be extremely fair? Don't you think he wants you to succeed? Don't you think he wants you to pass the judgment? So let's read what this judgment entails, though, because he has to be fair and honest. Let's look at the rest of the phrase. Judgment seat of Christ, let's keep reading. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. Things did not change when Jesus died on the cross. The animals that those Jews were sacrificing, the animals that even Adam was sacrificing were there no, when there were no Jews, that represented the forgiveness, that represented covering, but there's still a judgment of what we do. Because Christ isn't considering, oh, did they do everything right? That's not his concern. His concern is, do you trust me? Do you really believe that my way is pleasurable? Do you believe what the devil says, that my way is not good? Well, your actions will show it. So here in this verse, he's saying, I have to see whether your actions were good or bad. Sometimes you can do something good, but the motive even behind it, God sees it and he's like, that action wasn't good. He's being nice so he could get something from that someone. That's not the character I want in heaven. So looking at the next verse, because we know there is a judgment, even for those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Looking at verse 11, let's read that. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We are made manifest unto God. I trust also made manifest in your consciousness. Because you saw me in heaven about to fall into that ditch, and you said, I will not keep quiet. I'm going to say, Ahmed, you better stop. <laughs> Something's going to happen. That's what Paul is saying here. Paul sees that God loves us. Paul sees that God is going to judge us. The same person who died for you is going to judge you. And he says, because I know that this is a serious thing, I'm persuading people. How serious do you take the gospel? Do you really believe that there are people just like those shootings that are going on, right, where people are dying, and there's people dying without hope? And it's here for free. We just read it. And all you have to do is believe it. If somebody was giving out $100 for every time you just texted them, 
and you knew people who were suffering, trying to get a job, trying to get money, trying to get their life better, you would call them, you would contact them. Yet we have this gospel where people are going to be living eternally with a home, and we're quiet. In fact, it's the pastor's job. It's those missionaries' jobs in Africa. I had to do homework. It dealt with East New York, actually. And it turns out there's mostly Trinidadians, Jamaicans, all sorts of Caribbean folk in East New York. The biggest population of immigrants here, Caribbean people. Don't tell me that you can't relate with people out there. Don't tell me that you don't know what to say. Just talk to them like you back home. <laughs> That's it. Be a friend. Just like that. <laughs> Just talk. Africans too. <laughs> if you don't have any affiliation like that, there's somebody out there that only you can reach. And if you don't reach them, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Because they love doing evil. Just like you used to love doing evil. Just like I probably, yes, I still love doing evil. But what changed? What is changing me, I should say? Let's look at verse 14. This is a Pathfinder text. I didn't even know what I was memorizing. Verse 14. For what constrains us? The love of Christ. Let's just stop there. The only thing that's going to constrain you to do what God says, just like in heaven, for those angels, just like Jesus, is the love of God. And if you don't give people the love of God, how are they going to change? You can tell me about the mark of the beast. You can tell me that all the Protestants are coming together, but if I don't see the love of God, how am I going to have enough confidence in God's love for me to make a decision like that? If you just teach me about whatever you believe, but you never told me about the love of Christ, or you just keep silent, I'm not going to have enough love to make a decision. If you ask a person on their wedding day, I'm assuming I'm not married, tell the husband, you know, the wife is telling the husband, can you, dear, can you just buy that at the store for the wedding day just so we can have it? Is, is the husband going to get it? Yes. If a wife asks the husband to get something on the wedding day, at least, he's going to get it. Why? Because they love each other. There's a commitment. So if you tell people to do things and there's no commitment, are they going to do it? No. This is one of the most important Bible studies you can give to people. This is one of the most important Bible studies we need to believe. Because if you're finding difficulty doing what God says, it might be because you're forgetting how much he loves you. So now let's end off. Because what is this judgment going to end in? Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, rather, verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5. We're going to end. Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Why is God so concerned with us telling people about his love and the judgment? Why? Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5. Let's read it. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Friends, there are people who are going to be in heaven, and they're going to be looking around and asking, you know, um, why is it that Ahmed, God forbid, is not here? What happened? Why is it that my favorite preacher, God forbid, is not there? Sister so-and-so, where is she? Wouldn't you have questions if you saw someone doing something really good and they're not up there when God provided everything? This thousand years, it says that judgment is given to God's people. We're going to have to look back at the facts 
of what happened on this earth. You wondering about your kids? Lord, I've been so faithful to you and my kids are not in the church. You're gonna get to look at the facts of that child's life and how much God tried and tried and how you tried and tried. And just like Abraham, God is answering prayers of other people and you feel like God wasn't answering prayers, but God was answering your prayers, working behind the scenes, trying to save that child. How he was trying to save me. You're gonna be looking at all of the facts. That's why we shouldn't judge people in church because you don't have all the facts available. People are sinning and you don't know what they've gone through in their life to bring them to that point. You're gonna have the facts in heaven to look at. And this is the first resurrection. So there are people who are dead. It says they live not again until a thousand years are finished. The wicked are not a part of that judgment. It's the righteous because we're trying to see, is God a God of love? Is God's way pleasurable? Let's look at the, the end of this chapter now. What happens? This is so serious. Revelation 20, verse 12 to 15. <clears throat> Let's read it. One, two, three. And I saw the dead, small and great, books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Let's stop. If you were to look at that last phrase, I want you to think about that seriously. If we were to be judged, these people who are there in heaven, they're not being judged by this. These people are being judged by their works. If I was to be judged by my works, there is no hope for me. Human beings being judged by their works, and the only difference between them and those who are saved is the blood of the Lamb. These people, they're being judged by what they did. God's people, they're being judged by what they did, but Christ covers their sins. And now you're looking at the next verse. Let's read. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Christ died, not just the first death, but he died this second death for us. This second death is more important than the first death. It doesn't matter what happens to us in this life. God is good, but he's trying to protect us from what's about to happen. People are gonna be judged by what they have done. And if it wasn't for God's grace, they have no chance. And if we keep silent and we don't tell these people, they are done. They have no chance in the judgment, just like us. Revelation 21, verse one and four. We're ending, we're ending. Revelation 21, verse one and four. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There were no more sea. Verse four, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. When there is heaven and a new earth, who wants to be there? Amen. Amen, right? After that judging of the wicked, and the wicked see that they're judged by their actual works, the reason God is wiping away tears is because there's going to be crying in heaven. God is going to have to wipe away tears because people that he died for, that we kept silent, that he died for, that he's doing everything right now to save, pass away in that fire. It's like all of his efforts in vain for some people. That's why we're gonna be crying. I want you to play the song that, um, that I asked for. It's just a song by someone reading this verse and really thought seriously about what he read here. So I just want to share a little bit about it. It's a song that's written in the form of a story. And it's a, 
a song talking about the pain that one feels when they go to heaven looking for someone that they thought was there and found out that they wasn't there. Now I know all of us have people that we desire to see there. And so as I sing this song, just think about them and also think about yourself as well and where you stand with Jesus. Listen. I dreamt I went to heaven last night. There were many mansions up there. What a wonderful sight. Then I saw a door with your name and something else written in red. It said this one's empty, he wanted the world instead. Tears in heaven, I know Jesus will wipe them away. And when I was crying, in his gentle voice I heard him say, there's a void in my heart. I you could see I wanted him right here with me and now I know why there will be tears in heaven there were many searching for family and friends of gold from end to end then I saw the books with your name and all of the secrets you hide and the tears came again as I saw all the times Jesus tried tears in heaven I know Jesus chapter 2, verse 1, 4 and 5. You can turn there quickly with me. 
First John chapter two, verse one, four, and five. It says, "My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father." Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Sorry, skipping to verse four. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Verse three, rather verse five. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. How many people wanna be in Jesus? Amen. God is trying to teach us how to take a mile in his shoes. Some people like to say, you don't know me, don't judge me. You don't know the shoes that I'm walking in. Take a mile in my shoes. Christ is telling us by his commands, take a mile in my shoes. See what it's like to labor for people who reject you. See what it's like to love people and pray for them when they do what they want. And he's asking us to partake in getting to know him. But if we turn away from the responsibilities and the words that he says, if we don't believe it when he says, I forgive you, if you confess your sins, I am faithful, I am just to forgive you and cleanse you. If we don't believe what God says, then for our eternal life that he died for, it will be in vain. So I'm just asking you, if you really want Christ to, if you want Christ to perfect his love in you, and you want to have Christ as your advocate, I ask you to stand. And if you, after hearing this message, are just like me, about eight years ago, finding out that Jesus died for me and that I don't have to worry about my salvation, and you want to say, Lord, save me by your blood. Save me with your righteousness. I want to accept you as my personal Savior. I want you to just raise your hand. If this is your first time, I want you to raise your hand and come up to the front. If this is your first time saying to Jesus, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. I want to accept you now. And please pray, 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 church. If this is your first time, I want you to come up to the front. This second appeal is for those of us who have already accepted Jesus. You can still come up to the front, but if you've already accepted